Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Philippians 2. Now, I'm going to take for granted because you guys are the, the Wednesday night churchgoers that you can study with me tonight, meaning that I'm going to be a little quick in going through some scriptures with you, and we're going to cover like six different scriptures tonight, but I'm not going to camp out a long time on these because I want to get these points in tonight. I'm going to talk again tonight what we started on Sunday. I really... You know, on purpose, spend a lot of time on that first one, and you'll see why. But I'm giving you five things, five things to help you prepare for the new year. Five things. Let me start with my foundation verse before I get off too far here. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, Paul telling the Corinthian church, you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. What did they obey, Pastor? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, yeah, given by Paul. What Paul had written to him about, told him to do. As you have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Say, God's working in me. It's God who works in you, both to will and do for his good pleasure. Now, the, the powerful part about verse 13 is this working out your salvation, God helps you do it. God's the one that enables us to do it. It's not our ability that's going to get us transformed in this life and changed. It's God's ability. It's your availability. If you don't make yourself, a, if, you don't, if you don't avail yourself to God, God can't work his ability in you. Uh, you have to avail yourself to God. Make yourself available and his ability will help you obviously to walk out what he desires for your life. But verse 12 is just a foundation text of what we're talking about of examining these five different things in our life. Because in verse 12 it says that we should obey. We should be obedient to what scripture teaches us. And in doing so, what are we doing? We're working out our own salvation. Two things with fear and trembling. What does it really mean, Pastor? Now, as I'm explaining this, go to Hebrews 12. What does it really mean to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Well, I'm really glad that you asked that question because I'm going to answer it for you. The word fear here is used in different ways in the Bible, New Testament. Sometimes it actually has a connotation of being afraid of something, but not in this context. In this context, it means, it means to have an absolute awe and a reverence for. An awe and a reverence for. Here's a better way to say it. I have a great respect for God, and I so respect Him, and I so reverence Him, that whatever He tells me to do, I'm going to do. I'm not going to argue with Him about it. I'm not going to reason it out in my mind why I should or shouldn't do that. If God said to do something, I'm going to do it. That's working out your salvation with fear. That's working out your salvation with fear. You don't work for your salvation. You work out your salvation. How do you work out your salvation with fear? Whatever God says, I'm going to do it. Because I so in, I'm, I'm so in reverence and awe of this God that I respect him highly. He's the greatest thing in my life. There's nothing higher. Therefore, why would I not do what God tells me to do in his word? Amen. And I know there's people today who say, we have no commandments. Yes, we do. Book of Acts says that Jesus went on to give his disciples commandments through the Holy Spirit. He also gave us a great commandment. That's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, our mind, and love one another as, you, as yourself. And he didn't say this is an option or if you think like new, you know, think it'd be good for you to do it. He said, this is my new commandment to you. My new commandment. Now Sunday, I'm going to get into what's known as trajectory hermeneutics. Don't write it down. Don't freak yourself out. Trajectory hermeneutics because the problem we have today in the context as a whole of the gospel is not really the full gospel. It's a part of but not the full gospel. Traje hermeneutics means the laws that govern Scripture. The laws that govern Scripture. There are laws that govern Scripture that you're not supposed to violate. And if you violate those laws that govern Scripture, you're going to misinterpret Scripture. 
It's that simple. It's not a big, hard thing. To, this isn't something man figured out on his own. This is what God taught us through his word. There are laws that govern scripture. We have some of the most famous preachers of the land today who have never even been through a year of Bible school. And they're teaching mass thousands of people. And they're, they're teaching. Now, they won't tell you this. They won't say, well, I'm teaching you trajectory hermeneutics. But trajectory hermeneutics is exactly what they're living by. What it means is if you're, if you're a, anybody who's ever used a weapon or any kind of rifle, gun, rifle or gun or of any, you understand trajectory. Uh, let's use the example of a sniper. All right. A sniper knows when he gets ready to fire on his target. All right. That he is going to have to adjust to wind and to climate conditions to have the proper traje trajectory of that, uh, you know, bullet to get where it needs to go. So what's going to determine the route that bullet's going to go? It's going to be determined by the conditions, the surrounding conditions. That's how he'll have to make adjustments to that obvious surrounding conditions. All right. Now we have in the body of Christ what's called trajectory hermeneutics, meaning we're going to interpret this Bible based on the current conditions. We're going to base it. We're going to we're going to determine what the Bible says based on our current way of living on things today, on what's going on around us. This is ludicrous. This is called heresy. We're not to in any way change the Bible based on the times. Doesn't matter what the times change. No, no matter the time, time change of the times, we're to stick to what the Bible tells us, period. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. But we have so many false heresies. We're no longer into error. We got lots of heresy being taught all over in the body of Christ. What does that have to do with us preparing for the new year? Everything. Everything. Because I guarantee you, you might be listening to some of this stuff, and if you're not careful, all of a sudden you're going to start falling for it. You're going to start believing in it. Now, very clearly, I want you to understand, first and foremost, why I spent so much time on this verse key. Let me back up. I didn't finish my phrase. All right? So, working out my own salvation with fear and trembling means what? I'm going to reverence what God's Word says, period. I'm not going to live by trajectory hermeneutics. Whatever God says goes. If God told me to forgive, I'm going to forgive. Amen. Right? If God says something's a sin, it's a sin. Amen. If God said I shouldn't do this, I'm not going to do it. If God said I should do this, I'm going to do it. I, I'm not going to base my lifestyle off the current conditions of the climate or, or the situation that's going on around in the world. I base what I live off the Bible. Yes. Period. I don't change the Bible to fit the times. Amen. Right? So to walk your, work out your salvation, walk your salvation out with fear means I so respect and reverence and honor God, I'm just going to do what the Bible says. Quit trying to co complicate it. Just simple, folks. Just whatever Scripture says, that's it. I'm going to do that. Praise the Lord. Working out your salvation with trembling, fear and trembling, means the context here is not referring again to me and you shaking in our boots. Oh, man, what if I don't do what God says? No. The word trembling here means it's a reference to the presence of God. Every time God's presence showed up, guess what people did in the natural? They trembled. They fell on their face. So working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, this is powerful if you get it. Some of you guys, chef might want to go do a study, did a great job Sunday night. Might want to go do a study on this and teach this further. But working out your, working out your own salvation with fear means I respect him, I'm going to do what his book says, and I'm going to do it with an awareness of his presence in my life. I'm going to be aware of his presence because if you just go by the book alone, there's certain things in life that you don't have a direct relationship to in the scriptures that you're going to have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, what he's telling you to do. So that's how you work out your salvation. I didn't mean to get into that too far, but I want to touch on that uh, real quick. Great little rabbit trail. Praise the Lord. A lot of, a lot of meat on that bone and we could go further, but that's not our focus tonight. All right. So to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, we got to do some examination. I so said, we got to do some examination. The Bible tells us to examine our lives. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We need to examine whether or not I'm doing what the Word says. We need to examine whether or not I'm responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God in my life. We should examine that. Because if we're not, guess what? Somebody's duping you. Somebody's got you duped. Somebody's, somebody's deceiving you. Somebody's seducing you. It ain't God. It ain't the church. It ain't your pastor. It ain't your spouse. It ain't your kids. It ain't your boss. Called the devil. Yes. Called the enemy. Right. And he doesn't come knocking on your door in a little red suit with a pitchfork and horns and a tail and say, I'm here to ransack your family. The Bible says he comes as an angel of light. Right. 
How does he get in most Christians' homes? Today, unfortunately, most Christians' homes, he gets in through their television and through media. Now, Christians that have learned this is an access point to Satan getting into my life and have cut him off from that, where's the next access point? Through the different types of preaching going on and what you're listening to of what's being taught. Because John 10 is clear. The number one way Satan takes advantage of believers is through the pulpit, through false teaching. So, very clearly, you and I got to make sure we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. How many want to walk in what God has for you in 2014? All right? So, to do that, you got to do some examination. Romans, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 said that you and I, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11, all these faith people, let us lay aside every weight. The sin which so easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You're in a race. Tell somebody next to you, you're in a race. From now till the trumpet blows or you go to be with the Lord, this is called a race. This is a race. You're supposed to run it with endurance. You're supposed to run it with endurance. How do you do that? Laying aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares you. What does that have to do with anything? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of faith. I spent the whole day Sunday teaching on this, so I'm not going to touch on it again. I'm just going to give you point number one of the five things that you need to do to prepare for the new year. Number one, you need to ask yourself this question. You need to be very honest with yourself about it. What are you focused on? What are you focused on? Is your passion of your heart pursuing to get to know God every day? Because that's the one thing that's needed. We just taught on it. And see, that's what verse 2 is saying, looking unto Jesus. The phrase looking unto there, that phrase looking unto actually means you turn away from everything else and you focus on one thing. When you look this up in the Greek, it says everything else goes by the wayside. I'm not going to look at this one thing and look at the, and look back to one thing and look at the, and look. No, no, no. It says you stop looking at all other things and you look at one thing. Because the term is undivided attention. Undivided attention to Jesus. Now, that means I'm chasing after him because I want to know him and I love him and I want to develop a relationship with him. Could I get an amen? amen? If you're not doing that, the rest of these aren't going to do you much good. So, number one, I got to be honest with myself and make sure. What am I? Can you drift from that focus? Yes, you can. You bet you can. I mean, just like a ship, not realizing it sometimes could drift off course a little bit. That's why you got to examine your life. That's why you got to examine. And remember what I told you Sunday? What determines, what is it, church family, I told you that determines what your heart's set on? What is it? What's the key that determines what's my, what my heart is set on? What you're doing reveals what you're pursuing. What you're doing with your life reveals what you're pursuing with your life. No, 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 no. This is all based on the first key that you got to ask yourself what you're focused on. I'm revealing a way that you examine your heart to see what you're focused on. What are you doing? What are you doing? You read your Bible at all? You go to church very much? You, you get pertinent. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Not just read it. Do you really, do you really learn from it? Do you, re, do you develop a relationship with God out of it? Does he speak to you when you read the Bible? Do you see things you didn't see? Do, you, do your eyes get opened up to stuff you never knew before? Because if you're just reading it, but you're not reading it with the right intent, right motive, and the right purpose, guess what? There's no revelation coming out of that. You're not getting to know God. Amen? Amen. But what you're doing reveals what you're pursuing. That's how you examine your heart to see what you're focused on. If you're somebody who makes an excuse all the time, and I don't probably believe anybody here on Wednesday night, or if you're somebody who says, I don't have time to read the Bible, don't have time to go to church, don't have time to pray, I guarantee you what, your heart's not focused on God. Because the one thing that's needed is this passionate pursuit of our God. If, the, if you have that, you're going to be Mary, not Martha. Right. Amen. So we already talked about that Sunday. Now, number two, everybody say number two. Back up to Hebrews eleven fifteen. Hebrews, I gave you all these verses Sunday. How many got a chance to look them up? Anybody get a chance to look them up? Uh, two of you. 11.15, Hebrews 11.15, look at this. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out. Now, this could refer to multiple groups of people of the Old Testament, because that's what it's kind of referring to. I'm going to use the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt as the example, but you can use others as well. Even those who came out of Babylon... Uh, later on after the Babylonian captivity. Truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. 
Write this down. Number two, leave the past behind. Don't go back to Egypt. Leave the past behind. Don't go back to Egypt. Egypt, if you don't know, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, we know we study the Old Testament in light of the new. And in the Old Testament, Scripture teaches us in the new, there are types and shadows in the old to help us understand the new. If you don't know it, Egypt is a type of the world. And when the, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, they were brought out of the world system. And when they were brought out of that world system, they were brought into God's promised land to now do things under God's kingdom system, not the world system. God delivered them from the world to bring them over into his promised land. Notice what it said. If they had called to mind, underline that phrase. If they, if they, if they, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out. You know what he's saying? If you don't examine your thinking and how you're thinking about things in life, you may still be living under the world system. It, it, you got you to gotta recognize, how am I looking at life and going through life? Is my mindset what the Bible says, or am I still basing what I'm doing off of what the world says? You got to leave Egypt behind. If you want to go into 2014 and have God working in your life, what God wants to work in your life, you can't keep living under that old mindset and go into what God wants, because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen. And a part of this thinking, a part of this mindset is not just thinking in the system of the ways of the world. It's also thinking of yourself the way you did when you were in the world. Only seeing yourself in the flesh and not seeing yourself now as who God made you to be. You're still living in Egypt. And one of the keys to examining my life, how do I know if I'm, if I'm walking free from that mindset? How often do you refer to yourself in the first person as a spirit being? What do you mean, Pastor? When you refer to yourself, well, I don't feel good. Okay, who, what, what first person are we referring to there? Uh, I promise you that's not your spirit because your spirit never, ever, ever doesn't feel good. You're either referring to your soul or your body. Who are you referring to in the first person? We're not denying stuff in the natural. Faith never denies what's of the natural, but faith denies it's right to stay that way. Right? But when I'm referring to myself in the first person as a spirit man, oh man, Brother Sutton was one of the best to do it in all of his life, and he did it right here in this pulpit when he was battling cancer. He stood in this pulpit and he said, Dr. Hilton Sutton does not have cancer. Amen. Amen. Cancer has attacked Dr. Sutton's body. But Dr. Sutton is a spirit and he don't have cancer. Amen. And I will defeat cancer because as a spirit being, I am recreated in the image and likeness of God. And I know how God operates, and I will operate under God's principles, and I will cause this change to take place in my body. He did, it did, and then he stood in this pulpit and testified as he was cancer-free. So how do you know, Pastor, if I'm leaving Egypt behind? One of the, this is just one of. I don't have time to go into all these in detail. But this is one of the ways you examine yourself to see, have I come out of the mindset of Egypt, mindset of Egypt, how do you refer to yourself in the first person most of the time? Meaning what? Stop and think about when you talk about yourself. Just stop and evaluate. Now, am I talking about my spirit? Am I talking about my soul? Or am I talking about, I'm depressed. Are you really? No, you're not. Your soul is dealing with thoughts that is trying to depress your being. Your spirit's not depressed because your spirit, again, is brand new, recreating the image and likeness of God. Your soul is dealing with thoughts that's trying to depress you. Press you down. Put you under circumstances. Put you under, under, under worry and care and all the stuff going on in this world. And all that's just dealing with thoughts. Can I get a better amen? Why did Jesus, why did Jesus tell his disciples time and again, why are you reasoning among yourselves? Reason's the voice of the mind. 
The average human who won't do what the Bible says reasons in their mind why they don't have to do what the Bible says. I have a gentleman that's under my leadership who is in another church and his pastor's in total agreement and he's a leader in the church and I know his pastor very well and he's asked to be uh, to have me as a spiritual father, a spiritual dad as well. And we were talking today and he brought this, this whole question about, he said, man, I'm now dealing with all these questions about law and grace. And everybody's telling me, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Pastor, I need some real definitive answers here. I pretty much understand it, but I'm not coming up with good answers to address these people. I said, well, first of all, you got to define what they're talking about by the law. There's two aspects of what the Bible teaches that the law is. But now today in modern Christianity, we have a third definition of the law. And that's probably what they're referring to. What is that, Pastor? That comes out of the trajectory hermeneutics. Here's the third aspect of what most say the law is today. Don't you even tell me about sin or about that I'm living wrong or don't, because you know what? I'm not under the Old Testament law. I'm saved by grace. You're not referring to a direct law that the Bible refers to. You're referring to one that man made up by trajectory hermeneutics. And, I, and he said, he said, Man, it is a popular message. I said, you better believe it is. What, what person's flesh doesn't want to hear? Live any way you want. Do whatever you want. Doesn't matter. You're saved by grace. But that ain't what the Bible teaches. Really, Pastor? Read Romans 6, Hebrews 10. Go read uh, Titus 2, 10 and 11. Go read all of the letter of 2 Timothy written to Timothy. Uh, just go through these verses. New Testament. And it'll tell you over and over and over again, what, Romans 6, 1 is a powerful. Okay, so we're saved by grace. Should we continue in sin? No. Certainly no. not. Well, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, well, what causes most Christians to continue in sin? Read the rest of the chapter. Because Paul said, you, 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 child of God, must now present your members. Hands, yeah. eyes, ears, Amen. mouth. Feet, legs, arms, every part. You have to present your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God doesn't do that for you. Your pastor doesn't do that for you. The reason a lot of Christians are still struggling with sin, they haven't been taught. You need to have an altar time with God that you present every part of these members of yours to God and say, guess what? They're now your tools. Instruments there, I love it. It means tools. All your hands and feet and arms, all your body is, these are tools. Originally, you were using them as tools for the devil. Now, we're supposed to use them as tools for God. My eyes will not look upon what only the devil would want me to look upon. My eyes are now tools for God. My eyes will not look upon things that God says I should not look upon. My ears will no longer hear the things that Satan used to fill my ears with. My ears are now tools for God. I will now use my tools as an instrument to be used for God's purpose. My hands used to do things that were tools of Satan, but they're not his tools anymore. You have to present them. You have to. But that goes against the grace teaching today. Doesn't matter what you do, you're saved by grace. Can I help you? I, I'll go over this real quick since I'm into it now, kind of in the muck and the mire of it. So I, I, said, I said two problems. They don't understand the law you're talking about. Some do actually refer to, I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Uh, yes and no. Let's back up. Yeah, you still have to keep them. No, you don't have to focus on them. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments? Oh, so I can go murder now. I can go commit adultery because, hey, I'm saved by grace. Some are referring to the Ten Commandments. Well, I don't have to keep those Ten Commandments anymore. I'm not under that bondage. I'm saved by grace. Now, wait, 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 wait. Jesus said, all right, here's the new commandment. Ready? Love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And love your neighbor as your, if you do these, Jesus said, you shall fulfill all the law, Ten Commandments, and the prophets, even beyond what the prophets spoke of. You know why? Because if you love your spouse, you're not going to commit adultery. If you love your brother, you're not going to lie to him. If you love your boss, you're not going to steal from him. Oh, man, they got tons of tools. Me taking one or two, they're not even going to miss them. You don't love your boss. Shout me down as I'm preaching good. 
See, if you walk in, see, Jesus was saying, you don't focus, you don't have to, isn't it cool? He got it narrowed down to one thing. He said, you don't have to try to look at all ten. Just, just focus on one. Walk in the wall of love and you fulfill all ten. Amen. Amen? Amen. So it's not, I don't have to fulfill the commandments anymore. It's I now walk in the one commandment, law of love, and I won't violate those other ten commandments. Could I get a better amen? amen. We all know, and this was the other part I was going to throw out there real quick. We all know we're saved by grace. So I told him, here's the other side of this. You've got to define what they're talking about by law. Well, I like to keep the law and save a great. What law? What law are you talking about? The only law you no longer have to fulfill is what the, there's two laws the Bible talks about. Ten Commandments, the Levitical law. That's right. All the law given in the, in, the, in the book of Leviticus to Moses about all these sacrifices and things they had to do for all these different things. And guess what? You don't have to do that anymore. None of you had to bring a blood sacrifice tonight. You want to know why? Because Jesus offered the ultimate blood sacrifice. You didn't just bring one once a year. There was all different kinds of stuff that if you goofed up, did something, did this, did that, whatever, you'd have to offer a sacrifice for that. That's the part of the law, you know, the Levitical law you don't have to keep anymore. Y'all would be happy about that. But that don't throw out the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments brought you to Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments showed you the need for a Savior. You weren't good enough to go to heaven. Amen. But once you're born again, the love of God's now in your heart. Yes. And literally God prophesied in the Old Testament, I will write my laws in laws. Laws. Yes. Not law. Laws in their heart. That's the, that's the love of God. And the love of God in there will not cause you to violate those Ten Commandments when you walk in the law of love. Could I get a better amen? amen. So I said, but here's the other side. What's grace? See, if you'll define grace, then you'll be able to better help them understand what they're talking about. Because the average Christian does not know what grace is. They do not know. Well, I'm saved by grace. What's that mean? Well, I couldn't do it. No, no, that doesn't tell me what grace is. You, you saying you couldn't do it doesn't tell me what What is grace? Can I give you the simplest definition? Jesus Christ. Jesus is grace. Because he's heaven's help to you. I have been saved by grace. How'd you get saved? I've been saved by Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus did, I got saved. Can you say amen? amen? But saying I'm saved by grace, I can do whatever I want means, well, Jesus saved me. Now I can live however I want. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got a problem with that? Because Titus 2, 10 and 11 says, grace teaches you something. Amen. Who's the teacher? Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus said, don't call anybody else your teacher. I'm your teacher. He's grace. What's grace? Can I, can I make sure you got this before you walk out the door? What's grace? Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 10, 11 says, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Can you say Amen. But you and I, listen to me carefully, you and I got to make sure we don't go back to this old mindset of Egypt. We got to make sure we're not thinking like, like we used to in the ways of the world and seeing things through the ways of the world. This is, why, this is why trajectory hermeneutics has gotten so popular in the church. Do you know why it's gotten so popular in the church? Because the world has crept into the church. Wait a minute, I'm not talking about sin even. I'm not even, I'm not even talking about sin. I'm talking about how we see things. Well, can you explain that, Pastor? I will. Give somebody a high five, so I'm glad you asked that question. What do you mean the world's in the church? What does the world determine success by? What does the world, how does the world look upon you and say, you're a success? How do they determine that? You got lots of money, you got lots of clothes, or big business, or tons of businesses now, or whatever, right? That's what they determine success by. That's crept into the church. No, it has. Sure it has. See, because almost every believer on this planet at some time or another, if they still aren't, at some time or another, they have given ear to these new preachers who are famous, big time, lots of money. And you know why they believe them over their little local pastor in a church of 70 people? Because he's big. He's got to be of God. He got tons of money, tons of cars. Big following, huge church. See, that's the world creeping into the church to say, this is what determines success by. And because of all that, he must be right. Really. 
Transport yourself back 2,000 years ago and follow the Apostle Paul around. And let's look at how big a following Paul had. Let's look at how rich Paul was. Let's look at how many cars he drove. Let's look at how many homes he owned. And let's look at how much money he had. You'd have thought, that preacher's a loser. Most Christians today that have allowed this mindset that they're going to follow the big time preacher, not all big time preachers are bad, but a lot of them are. Well, you're speaking against them. No, I'm not. I'm speaking against what they're speaking. Can you say amen? I have a quick question for you. Can I ask you a quick question? All right. Do you believe, do you believe God breathed into you every single one of you and every human on the planet life? Do you believe God breathed that life into you? I have a question. Then why do people do evil? I'm going to use chef. Chef, why do people do evil then? If God breathed that life into why do people do evil? Oh, really? Wow. Even Sheffield knows this. How many else know that answer? Why do people do evil? Because they have a fallen nature in them. Because sin, the sin nature of Adam has infiltrated their life through their birth being into this earth of a fallen nature. Do you all agree with that? Would you like to know what one of the most famous preachers in the land said? And he was just asked this two weeks ago on national television. You want to know his answer? I don't know. Why do people do evil? I don't know. I don't understand it all. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. You have the largest following, thousands of followers listening to you, believe in your gospel, and you know everything about the Bible, and you don't know the first thing about salvation? You don't know the first thing about what makes people do evil? That was his answer. I watched it. My jaw, my jaw dropped to the ground. And I just slapped myself and said, man, you, I cannot believe it. I, can, you, I don't know. I don't know because I just don't understand it all. Then go sit at home and let somebody else preach the gospel that knows the gospel. I'm not against you. I'm just tired of you misleading people. Because you're hurting people's lives. Amen. Put a smile on your face and say, I think I needed that. Praise the Lord. I think I needed that. All right. So you and I have to do what? Come out of Egypt. Say time to come out of Egypt. Got to leave the past behind. How do you do that? If they had called to mind. They are called to mind. You got to think about what your thought life's like, what you're always doing with your mind in relationship to stuff in life. And if it's still the way of the world, time to stop looking to Egypt. Go to Proverbs 4. Let's go to Chef's verses. Proverbs 4. I thought for a minute, don't you preach my message, man. <laughs> Proverbs 4. He didn't. Proverbs chapter 4. Praise the Lord. Chad did very good for his first time too. Praise God. Yes. Amen. God's raising up some wonderful ministers in our church. Proverbs chapter 4, quickly, quickly, quickly. Verse 20, 420. We're going to take off now. Come on. We'll go. We're, we just came out of second gear. We're going into third, and we're about to hit fourth, man. So hold on. Here we go. Kathy will love it because she loves going fast. Amen. Proverbs 420, I'm married to the right woman. I'm telling you what. Amen. Married to the right woman. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 420, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them. In the midst of your heart, you have to keep them there. Their life, the word life there means their divine energy. Their divine energy to those who find them. And their health to all their flesh. Uh, underline, circle, highlight, put arrows around something. The very first part of verse, uh, excuse me, all of verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. Because out of it is the source, the spring of which the issues of life come. Where does this divine energy come out of? Your heart. Your heart. If you don't guard your heart, guess what you're doing? You're stopping up that divine energy. You're, you're literally stopping up God's divine energy, the life of God from flowing out of you. If you don't guard your heart, guard your heart with all diligence. You want a Roy Hicks quote? Work hard at it. That's diligence. Work hard at it. I remember he was having a meeting with Dr. Barclay one time. They were just together. And he said, you know, Mark, he said, I've been studying this word diligence now for several months. And he said, you know what? I, I can only come up with one definition of the word diligence. What's that, uh, Brother Hicks? Work hard at it. Work hard at it. 24, put away from you a deceitful mouth. Put perverse lips far from you. Hang on, children's kids. Moms and dads, we're going we're to have you go get them in just a second. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. It's 26. Ponder. I live there. <laughs> Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from, from evil. Number 
Number three. Ready? We only got two more after that, so we're almost done. Real quick, number three. Write it down. Examine what you're hearing, seeing, saying, and doing. Amen. I'm not telling you. That, I'm not preaching to you that I don't do. I do this stuff. Examine. And going into 2014, what am I hearing? What am I seeing? What am I saying? What am I doing? That's what he just told you. How do you guard your heart? You got to watch what you hear. You got to watch what you see. You got to watch what you say. Got to watch what you do. I'll give that to you one more time. How do I guard my heart, Pastor? You got to watch what you hear. That ain't enough. You got to watch what you see. Ain't enough. You got to watch what you say. Ain't enough. You got to watch what you do. That's what he just told you. Watch this. I'll give you the verses. Look at verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Verse 20, watch what you hear. Watch what you hear. 21, do not let them depart from your eyes. What? His word. There's, watch what you see. Watch what you see. It still shocks me that people want to have all their friends tell them about their life on Facebook and social sites or going and looking at junk stuff all over on, on media and not realize what you're seeing is affecting your heart. You got to guard it. You want the life of God coming out or, or do you want it suppressed and hidden? I want the life of God emanating from every part of me. But that ain't going to happen if you don't do what the Bible says. Ladies and gentlemen. You could have the, the, the most awesome apple pie sitting in front of you. I mean, steaming hot. And boy, you can just whiff that. Oh, man, that smells good. I'm telling you what. And just your appetite, you know, is just going nuts. And, and your, you know, your saliva is just going nuts. And your body's saying, prepare. Oh, prepare. All hands on deck. All hands on deck. We're about to eat a lot of sugar here. You know, I'm but you know what? There's no encountering what that apple pie can do to you until you actually take it and eat it. Amen. You can hear the word, read the word, listen to it, but until you do it, it doesn't impact your life. Amen. You got to do it. Can't just hear the sermon. Right. Amen? Ask yourself, what am I seeing? What are my eyes looking at? Are they peeking on at some stuff every now and then I shouldn't be? Are they watching stuff that's, that's going to uh, obviously infiltrate my heart with things that's not good for me? Because if you learn to do these things, I'll tell you what, you're going to see the life of God emanate from you. Yeah. Verse 24, put away from you a deceitful or false mouth and put perverse, contrary lips far from you. There's what you got to watch what you say. Perverse means quit speaking against the word of God. Say what God's Word says. I don't feel like it. I, don't, I didn't ask you what you felt like. Say what God's Word says. Period. Remember the old saying? If you ain't got nothing good to say. But the problem is, that's not really a helpful statement because if you don't say what the Word says, it's not going to help you. So we got to add to that. If you don't have nothing good to say, don't say that. But you do have something good to say. You got the Word of God. Right? The last one is in verse 26. Ponder what? Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be what? There's the doing. Watch what you hear. Watch what you see. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. I would examine your life over these three days of prayer and say, what have I been listening to? Who have I been listening to? What am I looking at? What have my, what what my eyes been taking in lately? What am I, what's my mouth been saying lately? Where have I been going lately? Who have I been hanging out with? Where have I been going? What have I been, what have I been doing? Thank you for all your amens. Amen. All right. Uh, all of our treasure hunters. Oh, excuse me. Uh, King's Kids Nursery. If you'll go get your kids. In Jesus' name, we love you. Call you blessed. If you can come back and join us, we'll see you shortly. Number four. Go to Matthew 6. Come on, just two more. Just two more. Man, I've only been preaching 38 minutes. You're going to get off easy tonight. Matthew 6. I only got two more to go. Yeah, but those two could take a long time, Pastor. No. <laughs> Told you I'm going to go through these real quick. We just hit fourth gear, man. <laughs> Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. Write down number four and I'll give it to you. Examine your money. Examine your money. And it never seems like the ones that need to hear it are ever around when they need to hear it. But I'll tell you what, it's very important. We all still do this. We've got to examine our money. Why? Matthew 6, verse 19. Jesus said it. Don't get mad at me. Red letters. 
Do not lay up. Do not. Does anybody here not understand what do not means? Is, do we need a, do we need like a, a hour long prayer service to you know get a revelation from heaven on, on what do not means? I'm working on it, Lord. I'll get it in a minute, Pastor. What do not do not? What's, does anybody understand what do not means? Yes. Don't do, not. do it. Amen. Do not what? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So 19 is like do not. 20 is do. Do what? Lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys. Where thieves do not break in and steal. 21. For God's not after your treasure. For where your treasure is there your heart is is also. God wants your heart. Drop down to verse 24. No one, again, do we need another hour-long prayer service to figure out who no one is? No. This would be nobody. Won't work, won't work. No one can serve. Nobody can. You cannot serve two masters. You will either hate the one, love the other, or at least you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. Can't serve God and mammon. I understand there's Christians who would never say, I hate God, because really they don't. But if you're born again, most Christians, if you're born again and you're still serving mammon and not God, guess what? You're loyal to your money, and yet you are so, in a way, despising God. I don't despise God. It means you're not, you're not uh, recognizing with reverence what His Word says about your money. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon's made up with five demons that drive the wealth system of the world. Poverty, debt, lack, lust, and greed. Lester Summerall taught it to Dr. Barclay years ago. Mammon is referring to a demon group of entity demons that control the wealth system of the world. Why do you think, why do you think people love money more than God? Poverty, lust, greed, lack, or what's the, I just missed one there. Debt, debt, poverty, lack, lack lust, or greed. Poverty would cause somebody to love money more than God? Oh, yeah. Fear of poverty. Fear of losing what I have. I can't give that to God. I can't sow that to God. I can't give that offering. I can't sow that tithe. No way, man. I wouldn't have enough money. That's called poverty. That's a poverty demon that's controlling your life. Can I get a better amen? Oh, I got to have this gun. Oh, I got to have this new toy. Oh, I got to go buy all this equipment. I can't tithe, but I can go buy all this equipment or buy all this stuff I need. That's called a lust demon. Well, I'll tell you, well, I can't give. I just don't have any money. Not true. Not true. The God's not after your money. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You've got to examine your money if you want to walk out what God wants for you in uh, 2014. Don't lay up treasures. Don't lay up treasures on the earth. Does that mean I don't ever put anything inside of my bank? It's not what he's saying. <laughs> Laying up treasures on earth means the bulk of what you do with your money is earthly. Not heavenly. Right? The bulk beyond paying your bills, the bulk of what you do, the bulk of what you do with your money is earthly, not heavenly. That's laying up treasures on the earth. Moth and rust will destroy. It will corrode. It will whatever you buy. Have you not noticed when you buy something, it don't last forever? Have you noticed that? Anybody had to ever have to buy another TV? Then another TV? Or a car and then another car? Clothes. I don't suppose you're all still wearing the same clothes you were born in. <laughs> I hope not. Amen. Amen. You understand? It's, it's understandable. You've got to have things in life. Obviously, there's necessities in life. But what he's saying is, if you don't honor me with the tithe and with the offerings, and you're saying you can't, you don't realize you're under the grip of one of these demons or, de or, or multiple demons. And unfortunately, you don't realize they're controlling your life and they're keeping you from what I desire for your life. I, if you give me your heart, guess what? The moment I got your heart, I can show you how to prosper. The moment you, I got your heart, I can reveal to you opportunity. The moment I got your heart, I can direct your steps and where I need you to go so I can hook you up with wealth. I can show you how to get it if I've got your heart. But if I ain't got your heart, I can't show you how to do that. Can I get a better amen? amen. 
Don't lay up treasures in, on earth. Lay up tre How do you lay up treasures in heaven? Let me help you. Don't get mad. You can give the Salvation Army, wonderful group, Red Cross, all these. But none of, that's not laying up treasures in heaven. What's laying up treasures in heaven? When you give to the work of the gospel, that is doing God's work on the earth and winning souls and making disciples out of them, you just laid up treasures in heaven. God, every single penny you ever sow that goes into the gospel, God takes account of it. God takes account of it. And he says, my daughter, my son, guess what? You can now walk by faith and draw from my riches in glory. Because you're laying up treasures in heaven. Could I get an amen? Your money don't go to heaven. I've taught you this before. Go to Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. I know I gave you a, a verse there in Matthew about fasting, but I want to go to Ezra to close tonight. Chapter 8. If you go to Psalms and just start backing up, it's right before Nehemiah. Help you out a little bit. You, Psalms is like right about in the middle of your Bible, and then just back up a little bit. Several, like three or four books there, you'll hit Ezra, right behind Nehemiah, right before Nehemiah. Go to Ezra 8. Ezra 8. Let me wrap this up on the money part, on the money issue. Where should I start? Be a tither. Well, there you go, Pastor. That's Old Testament. That's of the law. No, it's in the New Testament. Amen. Jesus said it. Paul said it. It's in the New Testament. God's not after your money. God's trying to help you to walk in the benefit that He has for your life and not be bound by mammon. It's a great thing to not fear not having enough. It's a great thing to fear not having enough. And it's interesting to me, my pastor is just now starting church as a baby Christian, him and Miss, Miss Vicky, and they're at, a, they're at a church in California. He's stationed at Camp Pendleton. He's gotten born again, and he's going to church there. And one of the very first sermons he hears preached is about money and about tithing. And in the midst of that message, man, his pastor's talking about if you, Malachi, if you don't tithe, you're cursed with a curse. God's not cursing you. There's a curse in the earth. And if you don't tithe, you're still under that curse system. Out loud. Because he's not churched. Dr. Barclay I'm speaking of. Out loud, everybody heard him. He turns to Vicky. he said, well, bless God, it's no reason we're cursed. It's no wonder we're cursed. <laughs> we're cursed, man. There ain't no doubt about it. We're cursed. We just found out why we're cursed. Yeah. I love Mrs. B. Mrs. B turned and said, you're the man. You fix it. <laughs> Isn't it cool how much women want to submit and make you the head of the home when they want you to fix something? Just a joke. Don't get mad. <laughs> but it was funny. He said everybody in the church turned and looked at him. Well, we're cursed, Vicky. I'll tell you, we're cursed. Now we just found out why we're cursed. Well, you're the man. You fix it. <laughs> and he did. Amen. And he went home and he said, we're going to become tithers. We're going to get out from under this curse. And God has brought them out from under that curse and blessed them. Kathy and I are out from under that curse. God's blessed us. We sat, we're not, we're not, we're not millionaires. We don't have tons of money in the bank. I'm, I'm, you look back, we talked about it the other day. We look back when we first got married and where we are today. Amen. Don't tell me God won't help you. Don't tell me God won't bless you. Don't tell me God won't, you know, get you through some stuff and, and you know, get you in a position to experience what he has for your life. Could I get a better amen? amen. God's challenging me, son. You, son, you want, you, you want to walk in this wealth aspect of what I have for you? You got to become more, more of an abundant giver. You sow sparingly, son, you're going to reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. If you're in the middle, you're in the middle. But if you want to be a bountiful receiver, become a bountiful giver. Amen. Amen. Last one, number five, write it down. Fast and pray to get God's plan. Fast and pray. That's what you're about to do. Fast and pray to get God's plan. Let's talk a little bit about this and wrapping up tonight. Five. This is number five. One, what are you focused on? Two, leave the past behind. Don't go back to Egypt. Three, examine what you're hearing, seeing, saying, and doing. Four, examine your money. Five, fast and pray to get God's plan. Fast and pray. Book of Proverbs says there are many plans in a man's heart. Many. That's all of us. But it's the Lord's counsel that will stand. Now you think about that. We have many plans and God has a plan. And the problem is we tend to listen to all of our plans before we ever find out what God's plan is. It's amazing how, much, how many decisions we make off of what we think our plans are, and then we finally get frustrated when our plans don't work, and we finally say, you know what? Let's find out what God's plan is. What if we just started there? Right? 
Fasting and prayer is a powerful way to do that, and that's what you're about to do. That's why I said your 2014 sheets are literally what God is speaking to your heart about what He wants to bring to pass. Now, I'm going to tell you, God told me this the other morning. He said, in 2014, I am going to bring some dreams to pass. So sure, there's things that God knows you're dreaming about that you're not coveting or that you're not chasing after, but there's still a dream that God gave you. It's got to be a God dream. But if it's a dream God gave you, guess what? God wants to bring those dreams to pass. He don't have no problem with you living in a nice place here. I mean, dear Lord, he built you a mansion in heaven. I said amen. Amen. But recognize, very important, that you're not pursuing those things, you're pursuing God. Many plans in a man's heart, but guess what? The Lord's counsel will stand. Now, Ezra, if you don't know, was a priest who came out of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. He was a descendant of Aaron. To be a priest in the Old Testament, you had to come through the lineage of Aaron. So he was an actual priest of God. Aaron, uh, excuse me, Ezra, sorry, Ezra. Ezra lived in the days after the Babylon, well, actually during and after the Babylonian captivity. Children of Israel in Egypt, brought out. Years later, after rebellion, Babylon king came and took them and brought them back into captivity. And guess what? Then God eventually brought them back out. The sad part is when they came out of Babylon, uh, very few came out. Most of them stayed in Babylon. Only a small remnant came out and went back to Jerusalem, God's promised land. The initial transfer of people out of Babylon actually went with Zerubbabel, who went and rebuilt the temple, which had to be done but so they could offer sacrifices once again to God before Ezra brought the rest of the people back so they could do what the Bible taught them in the Old Testament. So Ezra's kind of like the second group of people. Now the temple's rebuilt, that he is now bringing the rest of the remnant of those who want to come back out of Babylon, Babylon, which is another type of the world, and come back to Jerusalem, God's promised land. So in the process of Ezra going to the king of the day in Babylon and saying, I want permission to take these people back home, the king said, okay, I grant you permission, go. You're welcome to go. But guess what? It was, a long, it was over a four-day journey to get there. And there were many enemies between Babylon and Jerusalem. So guess what you need to know? What's the, what's the, what is the path God wants us to take? How does he want us to get there? That's what you're praying about over the next three days. What is God's path for me in 2014? What's his plan? And I'm going to show you how well, fast, whoop, I'm going to show you how well fasting works uh, to get God's plan. Ezra chapter 8, are you there? Yeah. Ezra chapter 8. Prophecy preview. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Pro, uh, Ezra chapter 8, 21. So Ezra says, then I proclaim. He, now he's a priest. He's a priest over, uh, over the uh, uh, house of Israel. I proclaim to fast there at the river of Ava. Now, now that's like me saying, all right, we're going to declare a fast for the church, a three-day fast. You don't have to. These people didn't have to. But Ezra's saying, hey, man, we need to get direction from God how to get back to Jerusalem safe. So we want to know for sure he's the one giving us the right path to get there because there's a lot of paths we can take. We need to know which one God wants us to get there. So he proclaims this fast. Notice this, that, listen carefully, underline it, that we might humble ourselves before our God, watch, to seek from him the right way, the proper path, how he wants us to go. What is his plan? We are fasting and praying, why? To humble ourselves. Humble means to be responsive to what he tells us. What good is fasting and prayer if God gives you something for 2014 that he wants you to pursue or do, and then you don't do it? See, we're doing this not just to hear from him. We're doing it to humble ourselves and be obedient to what he tells us. We're not just getting his plan so we say, oh, I got God's plan. Well, we're not going to do it, but we got God's plan. That'd be stupid. So that's why it says to humble themselves because it means to be responsive to what his plan is, the direction he wants them to go. We're fasting and praying that we might humble ourselves before our God. Why? To seek the right way. Say, I'm going to seek the right way. You know what that is? That's God's way. We're going to seek the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions, everything that we have. For us today, that sounds like this. I'm praying. I'm going this three day of fast and prayer. I'm going to seek God for my life, for my family, and for everything we have. If he tells us to let go of something, we're going to let it go. If he tells us to believe something in, we're going to believe it in. But whatever it is, we want God's plan. Amen. If I got something that's a God to me and God wants me to get rid of it, I'll get rid of it. Amen. I want God's plan. Amen. Can you say Amen. When God dealt with me years ago, son, your bull riding is still your God. I said, you're right, but I'll fix it. 
Little did I know what it would take to fix that. But I began to talk to God about it, and God dealt with me. You give away every buckle. You give away every picture. You give away everything you have uh, that relates to you finding your pride and value and worth in what you did as a bull rider. Well, that's kind of harsh. You kidding me? That stuff's going to burn up. To, to, have, to hold on to something like that rather than have God and God's plan? And I gave, asked Kathy, I gave it all away. You know why? I learned like Paul. It's like dung <laughs> compared to knowing Jesus. Don't compare. Don't compare. I'll move on. I can't go there too far. 22. Notice this. For I was ashamed. Initially, he was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers. I don't want soldiers to go with us. Our God's going to go with us. Amen. What he just said was, we're not going to lean on the world to get this done. Our God's going to take us through. Amen. Our God's going to give us his plan, and therefore he's going to be the one to get the glory for it. Oh, I wish I could preach on that for a minute. I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. In other words, we've been bragging that we know God. We've been bragging on him. And we know God and he's going to get us there. So the last thing in the world I'm going to do now is go ask the king to help us. I don't need the king's help. God's going to show us how to get there, and God's going to be our protection to get us there. Amen. Woo! How's that apply to us today, Pastor? You don't pray and fast and ask God what his plan is and get his plan and then go to the world to institute it. Come on. Come on, Larry. Good. I, I don't have time preaching. I got to go on. Verse 23. So we fasted. What did they do? Yes. Underline these two words, please. Number one, fasted. We fasted and underline this word, entreated. See, fasting's worthless if you don't take time to entreat your God. What's entreat? Inquire, pray, seek Him. Fasting does you no good at all if you go through three days. Why well, didn't you eat a single meal for three days? Fasted the whole day. How much time you spend in prayer? All oh, 20 minutes did you no good. 20, you took 20 minutes and three days to talk to God? And that was going to get you an answer from Him? They fasted and entreated their God for this. Oh, I love the last part of the verse. You ready? Woo! And he, little George Evans, and he answered our prayer. What did he do? Why? Because we tuned into him. Amen. Say it. We tuned into him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Fasting didn't move God here. Fasting didn't move God. God was speaking to them all along. Fast, fasting changed them. It didn't change their God. It changed them. It got them to get their flesh to shut up and get quiet and tune into their God and what their God was saying to them. That's why fasting deals with your flesh. Now, i got to wrap this up. I've got four minutes left. So let me wrap this up real quick. When you fast and pray, this is how you have to be effective in fasting and praying. When you pray, you have to get in a quiet place. No television, no radio, no internet. Oh, this is going to bug some of you. No cell phone. You can live without it, I promise, for an hour. And, and I promise you the world will not fall in and everything fall apart. Because I guarantee you, you take that cell phone into your prayer time, it's going to ring, ding, buzz, or something. And if it, does any, if it doesn't do any of those, your flesh is going to say, what's the deal if I just look on Facebook for just a second? Who are you talking to, God or Facebook? Amen. Who's got your attention? See, fasting doesn't work if you don't inquire of the Lord. To inquire of the Lord, listen to me, you have to quiet yourself. You have to quiet your brain, your flesh. You have to quiet your body. Well, my stomach's growling. How do I quiet that? You just say, I ain't paying attention to you. I'm a spirit. Shut up. I'm not listening to you. Guess what? It, you know what it's like? It's like my little dog. I'm not kidding. It's just like my little dog. She wants her dinner an hour before her dinner is due. She wants her lunch an hour, sometimes two, an hour before her lunch is due. You know what? I'll guarantee you there's been times and she just bugs you and bugs you and I'll tell her no and, I'll, and you know what I'll do? I won't pay any attention to her. And if you, if you don't pay attention to her after a while, you know what she'll eventually do? She'll go lay down for a while. Now, she'll be back, but she'll lay down for a while. Guess what your flesh will do if you stop listening to it, quit paying attention to it? It'll lay down. It'll shut up. But inquiring of the Lord is tuning in. Get that radio, come on. Get that spirit man tuned into the Holy Spirit, to God. What's God saying to me? Ladies and gentlemen, the goals God's going to give you, they're not going to come to your brain. They're going to come to your spirit man. 
He's going to reveal them to your spirit. And that's why you got to get your mind and you got to get your body quiet. I'm going to tell you what, most of us honestly can't get our bodies quiet in a closed room somewhere. It's the mind we have a problem with. Silence to the average human's mind today is, I mean, it's like, it's like torment. It's like I'm jailed. I'm just going to sit here for an hour and think about nothing? No. You start by thinking about God Amen. and talking to Him. Now, wait a minute. Don't go in your prayer time. Don't go in your inquiry time and pray the whole time. Pray. That's what I'm doing, Pastor. I mean speak the whole time. Don't go sit there and pray in the Spirit for an hour and then leave your prayer closet. You didn't give them any opportunity to answer you. During these times of fasting and prayer, it's good if you want to start off with praying in the Spirit and dealing with your flesh and quieting your mind and getting zeroed in on the Holy Spirit. But you need to then shut up Amen. and get quiet. Because you know what? If I do all the talking in my conversation with my wife, there is no relationship. There is no relationship. You have to do some listening. Amen. I like a better amen. Amen. I knew it. I was waiting on it. I knew it. That's why I was like, wait, come on, Clayton. You got to come through for me, buddy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it doesn't do any good to fast if you don't entreat the Lord. To entreat the Lord, you have to quiet your flesh. You have to quiet your body. You have to quiet your spirit. I was, and I gave it to you in your notes, you know, earlier. This I gave it to you on Sunday. Uh, I gave you out of Matthew 6. I think it was like uh, 16, 17 in there. And Jesus said, when you fast. He didn't say if. When you fast. Notice what he says, though. Your father who is in secret rewards you openly. What do you mean? He's in the secret place. He's in the place where your mind gets quiet and your body gets quiet and your spirit tunes into him. And that's where you'll start getting rewarded by hearing from the father what he wants for your uh, life in 2014. You, your family, your stuff. Don't just go in there thinking God ain't going to talk about your stuff. Because I'll guarantee you what, if your stuff's a problem, God's going to talk about some of your stuff. If your stuff is keeping you from walking with God, I promise you this, you're going to hear something about some of your stuff. Amen. Or relationships or things you're doing. The purpose isn't, let's fast and let's pray for three days and let's just get close to God. And after three days, we go back to everything that we were already doing before. No, oh, no. We come out of that time and we now make adjustments to say, all right, here's what God wants me to pursue. Time to reestablish my course now on what God has for me on 2014. Can I get an amen? This concludes another message from the ministry of Reverend Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624.